So today let's make another episode of my solid state Tesla coil series with my ketonate of course and this time let's try to load my half bridge using an inductive load instead of a resistive load and let's try to test various capacitors and resistors in the snubber networks and measure the waveforms on my oscilloscope. And if the waveforms are nice, I can later try to connect it to mains instead of my bench power supply. At this point, I'm powering it from a bench power supply, 30 volts. But later I will run it using one half cycle of 230 volt mains. Now let's try some inductive load using this coil of wire basically. And here is the lower gate voltage and the output voltage of the half bridge. Let's turn it on. It's kind of a square wave but with some overshoots here and here and some notch here. When the transistors turn off the voltage overshoots here and here for the other transistor. And this tiny notch is probably when the current stops going through the diode in the transistor and starts going through the actual transistor. Let's zoom it. And this notch happens just a little bit before the middle of the pulse, which is typical for mostly inductive loads. Nearly half of the time the diode actually carries the current. And then, just a little bit over half of the time, the current goes through the transistor. Let's put some other resistor in parallel to the resistor of the snubber network to reduce the resistance. And it actually makes it slightly worse. And now let's put another capacitor in parallel to the existing capacitor to see if it helps. And yes. A higher capacitor actually reduces the voltage of the peak. Now it's lower capacitance, higher capacitance, lower, higher. A higher capacitance reduces the peak a little bit. And there is probably quite a lot of inductive current in it. At 30 volts it draws 1.2 amps, about 36 watts. But the inductive current is probably much higher than this. And this is one microsecond per division. Let's zoom the peaks. Now it's half a microsecond per division and the peaks are about 200 nanoseconds long. Now let's try some induction heating. When I put an aluminium foil to the coil, it's getting hot. And this tiny notch is moving to the left as it's getting more resistive. Can you see that? When I put the aluminium foil to it, it moves to the left. When it's more resistive, the diodes pass the current shorter and the transistors longer. But the overshoots are quite scary. When I change the input voltage, it seems to all change proportionally. But of course the overshoots also depend on where do I connect the oscilloscope. I connect it to the same wire or trace just a couple centimeters away and those overshoots look completely different. Even the inductance of a couple centimeters of a conductor is quite significant. And this is also the reason why the snubber networks have to be as close as possible to the transistors. And this is 10 volts per division, so the power supply voltage is about 30 volts. And with the overshoot, the total voltage on the transistor is about 50 volts. And more capacitance in the snubber networks makes those overshoots smaller. And those overshoots also transfer into the gate of the transistor via the reverse transfer capacitance. And if I try to bypass the resistor in the snapper network, there is a ringing here. And now let's try to tell what's the peak current in it. I don't have any current sensing resistor in it, but it's also possible to sense the current on the capacitors. 
and to basically calculate the current based on the voltage rate of rise or fall. You can basically tell the current of a capacitor based on how fast it's charging or discharging. So let's measure the voltage on the lower half of the capacitive divider. And it's 5 times 2.2 micro, so it's in total 11 micro. And here's the waveform on the capacitors. Now let's zoom this section of it to see how fast it's discharging. And the steepest slope is 200 millivolts in 80 nanoseconds. And according to my calculation, this comes out as 27.5 amps peak current. And on the capacitor it's this waveform because initially the capacitor is charging from the energy stored in the inductor from the previous half cycle. And then the capacitor is discharging and the energy goes back into the inductor. And the same is happening in the other half cycle but now I'm sensing just one half of the capacitor bank. And some wireless energy transfer here. It works nicely. And of course the current it draws from the power supply is much lower than the current in the coil because it's mostly inductive. Most of the energy is just bouncing between those capacitors and the coil through the transistors. And when I try to put even more snubbers on it, like this, the overshoots are much smaller now, but those resistors in the snubber network are going to get bloody crazy steaming hot. And they are going to be self-desoldering probably. And this is already at about 30 volts. The snubber networks are always a compromise between how much you clamp the overshoots and how much you dissipate in the resistors. And if I bypass the resistors, it's ringing. With no resistor, just the capacitor in parallel to the output, it's not so lossy, but it's ringing horribly. And this is also not good. And so now the snubber networks are about 25 nano and 4.7 ohms. And this is 30 volts and another 12 volts overshoot, which is not so much. But of course the overshoots depend on the output current. The lower the output inductance, the higher the current and the bigger the overshoots. If I stretch the coil, it has a lower inductance, the current is higher and also the overshoots are bigger. But of course the final primary is probably going to have a higher inductance because it's going to run at a higher voltage. And the overshoots seem to be proportional to the input voltage. But they reduce with higher inductance of the primary. So it seems like the overshoots shouldn't be too high for the transistors at mains voltage, but now it's all about the bravery of sticking this into mains. Now the question is, who's going to stick this into mains? My cat probably. But of course let's give it some potentiometer to regulate the frequency. So here's the potentiometer to tune it and... For any case I used a shielded cable for it, so it doesn't pick up the interference from the secondary. And it's tunable. It goes from 90 kHz to 150 something kHz. My secondary should be somewhere in this region and if it's not I can change the capacitors in the oscillator or the series resistor of my potentiometer. And now it's loaded with this big primary, 5 turns and it has a higher inductance and the overshoots are just a small fraction of the input voltage so it should be fine. Quite small overshoots now. And now the peak slope on the capacitor is about 50 millivolts per 160 nanoseconds. And so the peak current should be about 3.5 amps. And at peak mains voltage it should then be about 35 or 40 amps. And of course with a higher frequency the peak current goes down. So I think I should get away with 3 or 4 turns on it. I want the peak current to be about 60 amps or at most 90 amps. 
And with three turns, it's about 7.3 amps, so at peak mains voltage, which is 11 times higher, it should be about 80 amps peak current at 90 kilohertz. But my secondary is probably going to be about 115 kilohertz, and at this frequency the peak current should be about 55 amps at peak mains voltage. So in this episode I made some experiments with an inductive load. So this is Diagon Wild and see you in my next videos and thanks to all of my patrons on Patreon. I really appreciate your support. And in the next episode let's take a look at some theory and then I can finally take a look at those gate current amplifiers which I keep promising.